can go ahead and get going here. Um, my name is Sean Yasutaki. I'm a science teacher. I live in Buffalo, Colorado. Um, I am, uh, well, I did, I did this talk up in Boulder, at the Boulder uh, Skeptic Camp. So if any of you have seen this before, I've modified it just a little bit. But otherwise, I really won't be offended if you get up and go see Stuart. Okay, because he's got PhD behind his name and I don't, <laughs> you know, so uh, take that for what it's worth. Uh, my talk today is on the other creation museum. Most of you have probably heard of uh, what they say is the creation museum in uh, Petersburg, Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati. Uh, I went to a one out in California, in Santee, California. It's about 25 miles northeast of uh, San Diego. I just happened to be out there a year or so ago and I was flipping through things to do and it just popped up. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize there was one of these right here. So I went out just to, um, just to go. And just, and just so you know, I actually went there, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I went in with the expectation, the one expectation I had was that I was not gonna say a word to anybody because I knew if I did, I probably would, um, let's just say, offend a few people. <laughs> So I went through and didn't say a word to everybody, but my, I think my jaw was hanging open. Uh, has anybody been to either this or the one in Kentucky or the one in the Creation Evidence Museum in uh, Texas or any of those? Okay. So you're, you're in for a treat. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting place. Let me just give you a little bit of uh, the details of these places. The one I went to is this one here, the Museum of Creation and Earth History. Uh, it was established by the Institute for Creation Research, which is uh, was run by. Uh, but it, it's, it's currently uh, the Institute for Creation Research moved to Texas about four years ago, and a private group called the Light and Life Foundation took over the, uh, the the running of the Museum of Creation and, and Earth History uh, at that time. Um, it was established in 1992, and it's about 4,000 square feet, and it's free to get in. All right, keep that in mind. Uh, the one in Petersburg, Kentucky, is one of our answers in Genesis. That's Ken Ham's group. It was established in 2007, and it's about 30,000 square feet. I believe it costs about 20 bucks to get in. Um, so <coughs> there, there's a big difference in terms of the, the scope of each of them. Uh, one of the things that I was struck by at this, in this uh, particular museum is how very low rent it is. I'm not, I'm not even sure what to call it a museum. Uh, it's not the type that I'm using. But what I did was I went through and I kind of took pictures of all of the, or a bunch of the uh, plaques. And I know some of them are a little hard to read, so what I kind of did is I pulled out some of the salient points about what each one says. So the first one asks, the first thing you see when you walk in is the question, what is science? And kind of the main things that it says here, you can read these. You know what, let me do this. I, I hate reading things off of PowerPoint because I think you can read them yourselves. So I'm just gonna kind of go over the points that I make. If you want me to read them, I will. But otherwise, um, so anyway. So the, the big thing that I was struck by here is that it, when they talk about the definition here. They used Webster's first dictionary in 1828. And last time I checked, a lot of the definitions that we have are just a little bit different than they were in the, what, 180 years ago, right? Okay? So what I did is I actually looked at the Miriam Webster dictionary uh, today, uh, just a little while ago, and the definitions that they use for science, other than uh, they talk about like, the science of baseball being like the uh, just sort of the, the knowledge of baseball. But they also talk about science, the very first one. This is this right here? Knowledge is distinguished from ignorance or misunderstanding. And this is the state, this is the, uh, the definition that is used more often by scientists. The system of knowledge concerned with the physical world and its phenomena. Okay? And the key word here is physical. Alright? When we talk about entering God and creation into this, that sort of falls apart right It's a little hard to call that physical. Okay. Um, the next, I actually have this set up so that the slide behind it will show up. I pull, again, all of these come, basically you walk through the museum and all they have are plaques and pictures. Okay, there's one display which I'll show you. And it's sort of interesting. 
Uh, but th there was a thing about evolution in the solar system, which I find kind of interesting, because evolution we usually talk about in terms of biological evolution. Uh, so how you can equate biological evolution with the solar system, the formation of the solar system, I don't know. Um, but there are three points that were on this, on this plaque that I thought were interesting. The first one, astronomers have found planets orbiting the other star. Well, that's true. And it is true that they basically cannot harbor life. They're too big, too hot, the uh, atmospheres aren't correct uh, to, to uh, sustain life. But that's because right now our technology for finding planets is so rudimentary that the only planets we can find are the ones that are really big, the ones that orbit really, really fast around their, uh, around their uh, host stars. So we can't find, yet, we can't find Earth-sized planets. We just don't have the technology. Now we're getting closer. The Kepler, is actually, uh, the Kepler probe, which was put up uh, a year and a half ago, has actually found a planet that is twice the size of Earth. So we're getting closer to the right, the right uh, physical characteristic. But even this one orbits in, well, I don't even remember. I think it's like two and a half months, three months. Is it three days? Is it that it's short? Four days. But I can't remember. Okay, it's a very short period of time because what, what they're, and, and I'm getting away from this just a little bit to explain this. In order for them to do this, they, they want to get like four or five good data sets looking at the star to see how much the star moves as a planet orbits around it. And, it, and, and since the Kepler's only been up for about maybe two years, four or five data sets means the shortest possible orbit you can have is a couple of months. And if the orbit around the star is a couple of months, that means it has to be really close to the star. All right? So we just don't have the technology to find Earth-sized planets that are far enough away from its star to actually harbor life. So that statement is true. That first statement is true, but it's completely irrelevant. Because just because we haven't found them doesn't mean they're not there. Um, this one right here, I'm, I'm kind of a grammar Nazi every time there's something in there that actually they misspell. That's what they put, I, not the sick, but everything else. Kind of. So I just. I'm annoyed by that, and so I want you to know that I didn't make that mistake. Okay, I'm kind of a grammar now. But anyway, uh, this, the space program has shown there's no life in the solar system. Well, that's true up to this point. We have not, however, looked at deeply into time. We haven't looked at Europa. We haven't looked at uh, Enceladus or some of the, uh, any of the other moons around Jupiter and Saturn. And it's very possible there could be life there. Now, it probably isn't intelligent life or life as we know it, but there's still going to be life there. So again, this statement is, it, the second part of the statement is true. The first part is eh, partially true, I guess. And then the last one I, is just kind of an amusing statement. The biblical creation is a better explanation for these as opposed to uh, the scientific explanation. I'm sorry. I don't know, something else. This should say biblical. Uh, creation is a better explanation for these than evolution is. And that's kind of like saying, well, biblical, you know, the Bible is, is better at explaining baseball than the rules of football are. Because evolution is not designed to describe the, uh, the origins of the solar system. It's described, it describes how life developed on Earth. So again, this statement is probably true, or maybe true, partially true. But it's irrelevant because you're talking about apples and oranges. <laughs> this is actually the sign that goes with this. And, and again, the, the salient points here. The second law of thermodynamics is the scientific reflection of God's curse on his created world because of sin. And I read that and I'm going, okay, so you're talking about science. So how is this next part of the statement testable? How would you go about testing that? Well, if you can't, then to say it's science is really meaningless. Okay? Um, and, and, sorry, over. Sorry, wrong button. Uh, this statement right here is just wrong. All processes tend to go in the direction of increasing. Well, you if, if you combine these two statements together, they are technically correct. This statement right here is wrong. They don't all go towards towards uh, increasing entropy. Entropy, by the way, um, do we have any physicists in here? We got in a really big discussion about energy and stuff last time. It was, it was kind of annoying. But anyway, um, 
Entropy is a measure of disorder, okay? And how things can go from order to disorder. And in general, it's sort of like a kid's room. Things tend to go from order to disorder really quickly. Uh, and unless you put work into it to rearrange everything, uh, things go from order to disorder. Um, entropy, like I said, if you put work into it, you can change the entropy state. You can actually make it less as opposed to greater. So if you take these two statements together, it's kind of true, but the biggest problem they forget is that when you add energy to a system, like adding energy to Earth from the sun, then you can, in fact, change the entropy state from lower order, or from higher order to lower order. Okay? And so this statement right here is just, is just a completely flawed interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics. I've actually had a discussion with creationists about the law the second law of thermodynamics. Most of them have no idea what thermodynamics is. Thermodynamics, by the way, is just, sorry, I'm talking like a science teacher now. Thermodynamics is simply heat energy flow. That's really all it deals with. Okay? And so when you're talking about this, this is heat energy going from a useful state to a non-useful state. That's really all it's there. But if you keep applying energy to the system, then you're applying more energy than is in a useful state. And so the whole idea of entropy doesn't fit in the Earth system. So, but the problem, and the problem is, most people don't realize that. So they read this and it makes perfect sense to them. This is the display I was talking about. This is the one display that they have that is not just pictures on a wall. Okay. This, this I don't remember specifically what this was, but it was had something to do with like the glory of the diversity of God's creation. And I looked at this thing and thought, okay, there are a couple things wrong with this. Number one is that all of these are actually like this is just a like a sea fan here, and all of these fish on there they're just stuck in there with pins. They literally have pins stuck in the back, and they're just stuck in there. And then the second thing I noticed, and I didn't even notice this, I didn't, didn't even think about this when I actually saw this in the museum. It was only when I looked at this picture and I went, okay, that's a clownfish. That's an emo. That's about, nah, yay long. And that's a worker. <laughs> I think the scale's off my teeth. I mean, if they're going to do something like this, I'm going to at least get the scale close enough. It's just I just looked at that, like, so when I looked at the picture later, I'm really glad I didn't notice it. Well, it was in there. Pretty much. I mean, I honestly don't know how this is supposed to convince anybody. I really don't. It's, 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 it's just kind of my fault. So, this, when I say it's low tech, and I and, uh, don't do it like say it is free, so take that in. <laughs> so, this is like the only. 3D, I'm sorry, it's one of two 3D um, displays they have. I'll show you one more coming up here in a second. So one of the things that they have there is they, they try to compare um, the Hawaiian flood mythology with Noah's Ark mythology. And so what, there was one statement in here that I pulled out that is sort of the, the, the main point. And you can read this right here. And this sounds a lot like Noah and building the ark and putting food on it and taking the animals and saving them from the flood and everything. Well, the biggest problem with this was that this particular tale was written in the late 1800s, which was after the missionaries had gotten there. Um, the, I pulled this off of the website sacredtext.com and this is actually the statement of the, of the folklore that was taken by, uh, by a historian among a group of Hawaiians who had not yet been reached by the missionaries. So this was in the, the, the later part of the 1800s, but it was among a group that had not been influenced by the, uh, by the uh, missionaries. And you can see this is quite a bit different than the the uh, apparently Noachian uh, tale. So when the when the Creation Museum says, well, the Hawaiian myth and the, the Noah myth appear to be this, excuse me, appear to be the same, it's only because of the Christian influence during the late 1800s and the 1800s 
that that's true. When you look at what the original tail was, it really has no, other than the mountain, it really has very little, um, very little resemblance. So for them to use this as a piece of evidence that this is what happened seems a little bit uh, disingenuous. Of course, they probably have never seen this one, so they just go to our way and see. Am I trying to actually defend them? Right. This is one that just kind of made me laugh. So the question of where did the water go after the flood? These are the four of the statements that are on there. This is true. I don't even know what that has to do with. That has anything to do with. I don't have, know how that has anything to do with where the water went. OK, so tsunami stopped. What does that mean? This one is, if you ask any geologist, that's physically impossible for the because if you think about it, if I want to widen the oceans, if I widen the ocean on this side of the earth, that means that the ocean on this side has to collapse, right? So the total area of the ocean stays pretty much constant all the time. Now, you could do it by squashing the ocean basin down and lifting up the continents. But because of the fact that all of the crust is floating on top of the mantle, that that, that, that amount of change isn't going to be that much. It might be a few feet. Okay. Um, any geologists think that, by the way? There's a, pr a principle called isostasis. If you take if you take two floating things and put them in water, one floats higher than the other, it's because it's less dense. The continents are much less dense than the the ocean floor. So the ocean floor sinks down a little bit into the mantle. That's why they're lower. And that's where the water is, and the continents rise up. Well, that the, how much it rises up is dependent on the difference in density between the stuff that's floating and the stuff that's floating on. And so the continents float at a certain height, but they basically always float at the same height because the density of the two doesn't change. Okay? So that statement, that third statement, is just impossible. And again, then if you get to the fourth one, and again, I don't even understand how that has anything to do with things. But I can just kind of imagine people saying, yeah, well, man, that makes sense. <coughs> <laughs> um, actually, I actually have this, like I said, so you can actually see the class. The, the, uh, but these are some of the things that, again, are were posted as, as what evidence there is for the flood and things that happened after. This statement right here, a geologist knows about the terraces that wave cut terraces and things around the lakes, around the ocean, in fact, in places, due to changes in the levels of lakes and levels of the ocean. You'll see these around, for example, the Great Salt Lake, you'll actually see terraces around there, uh, that are due to the changes in the height of the, of the, uh, of the lake. There's actually also terraces around um, uh, the Bonneville Salt Flats, because that actually used to be a lake that was was several tens of meters deep. And the, those are either, the terraces are actually caused by the waves eroding away the sides of the lake, so it kind of erodes these flat surfaces. And when the lake drained out, those flat surfaces stay you know, 15 or 20 meters up above the, above the lake bed, the dry lake bed. And so like you can build houses up. And so a lot of these places where you see houses built up on top of the, the terraces on the sides of the mountains, they're actually there because of that. Um, now, again, those are actually there, but if this were true, you would actually see terraces that would kind of go all the way from where we see them, say, around the Great Salt Lake, all the way down to the ocean. As the water receded, you would expect to see these at every level that the, that the water was at during the time when it receded, and yet you don't. You won't see them in those specific places. Um, this part again is true. This part again is true that you actually have places in the Sahara Desert, for example, that used to be very, uh, very heavily vegetated with, with uh, grasslands and stuff, and now it's basically just desert. Um, but again, there, why invoke a flood when you can just say the climate has changed? Because we 
know that the climate is changing. We see lots of evidence in the fossil record or in the geological record. Um, and then we get to this last one. If the flood happened 4,000 years ago, we have had, I'm sorry, yeah, about 4,000 years ago, the glaciers, here in Colorado, there's evidence of at least five glacial events. So that means in the last 6,000 years, we've had five, five glacial events happen here. If that's the case, why don't we have um, evidence of that in the lore, in the folklore of the people that have lived here? Because those types of things get passed down from generation to generation. And yet, you don't hear of this kind of thing going on. You don't hear of ice ages being talked about in the lore of the American Indians, or, or of uh, you know, some of the tribal, uh, the, the Latlanders, for example, that type of thing. You don't hear it. So why is it not there? And one of the simplest explanations is that it did happen during the time when those tales were passed down. Um, I found this one really interesting. Uh, there, if you look in just about any creationist book, one of the things we'll talk about is the fact that there's not enough mud in the ocean floor to have been eroded away over the course of billions of years of, of, uh, of Earth history. And so this statement right here I've been able to verify is true. Okay? The, the rivers of the world wash about 20 billion tons of sediment out into the ocean every year. And then they bring this up. The average depth of all the sediment in the whole ocean is less than 400 meters. And that is probably true. I have not been able to verify that, but that does not seem unreasonable to me. Uh, I do know that in areas along the, um, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, you get you know, just a few meters of, of, uh, of sediment. Um, and then this last one, the process that I conveniently left out, is the process of, of a geologic subduction where uh, two geologic plates collide and one gets pushed down underneath another, basically dragging all the sediment down with it. And so 19 billion tons accumulate on the ocean floor, which seems, again, seems, I have not been able to verify that part, but that seems reasonable. Well, this is the statement that really kind of makes me cringe. Because if the average depth of the, of the sediment across the ocean floor is that much, sure, that seems like you couldn't have that little sediment in you know, billions of years of Earth history. Well, the catch is, where's a lot of that sediment right now? It's out here in the mountains. That little turn. It's out there in the mountains, OK? We've got layers of sediment that are, that are thousands of feet thick that form the rocks that are currently out here, OK? Uh, Garden of the Gods, which some saw a picture that uh, John had of people. That actually is made up of, actually that's river sediment, but that's some of the sediment that they're talking about. And then you look at the Mississippi River uh, Delta. The reason they can drill for oil there is that there are places where the sediment there is 9,000 meters thick. That's 27,000 feet. Now, if you think about the fact that in those areas, the ocean floor, or the, the uh, depth of the top of the layer is only about maybe five or 600 meters, that means that there's 27,000 feet of, of sediment sitting there, literally pressing the Earth's crust down so that the bottom of the ocean floor is actually bending down under the weight of all this sediment, okay? Some of those, some of those uh, drill holes that they put in the delta, in the Gulf of Mexico, go down 15 or 20,000 feet. It does not go down into the basement rock, it goes down into the sediment that comes off of the Mississippi River. And so for this statement, or for that statement there, again, while that may technically be true, it's completely irrelevant to understanding where all that sediment is. Okay. I've not been able to verify how much sediment comes off of the Nile River, but I would suspect that the, the, the depth of the uh, Nile Delta probably has to be at least 5,000 meters. Okay. So, that statement, again, may be true that it's completely irrelevant. I read into this, and uh, any, again, if there are any geologists that read this, I read this, and I, there are two terms in here. This one right here, and uh, this one right here, that I've never seen before. And, you know, I went to college 30 years ago, and I thought, well, maybe those terms popped up in the last 30 years, so I looked them up, okay? So they're saying that intermediate fossils are more rare than, than you would expect. 
back. Uh, a, few, a few examples that we found may be something called ecological intermediates, and I have no idea what that means. Um, and the newer ones may be stratomorphic series documented using intraperineal diversification. And I said, okay, what's that? And so I looked them up. And it turns out that this, this term barominology or barimen refers to kinds, biblical kinds. <laughs> so they basically took, made up a term to say, well, these are the kinds that we can't change outside of kinds. So this intra bear and this spell that we have. Is this says intra, and that says intra. Dang it. I mess up up here. That should be intra. Barometer meaning in between, or uh, in within one uh, kind, or within one barometer. Sorry, my fault. What's that? It's a bad yeah. word. Though. Yeah, that's true. Right. <laughs> it's like a made of anything else that they don't get But anyway, so so the term intrabarometric simply refers to within a kind, which is like defining yourself into existence. You know, and then the stratomorphic. I think I have not been able to find this, but I'm guessing it must be. Like a, a combination of stratigraphic and morphological, meaning within a particular uh, bed of rock, you have changes. And gee, I don't know about you, but within that that stretch of rock, if there are changes, I would pretty much call that evolution. Yeah. So they're basically defining evolution as stratomorphic changes, and then saying that evolution doesn't occur. I don't get. It. I left this place with a headache when we thought I really did. This is another one that kind of made me cringe a little bit. Um, because what they, what they had, and this is the other 3D thing that they had, um, they had a, uh, two skulls up, and I'll show you these in a second. One is said Homo erectus, one said modern human. Okay? And they were trying to claim modern human is probably a true human being. Okay? Um, well, these are the skulls. This is the Homo erectus. This is the Homo sapiens. Now I don't know about you, but as I look at this, the brow ridge, the connection of the uh, of the, um, the jaw muscle, I don't know specifically what that called, and then the shape of the back and the front of the head are so completely different that I don't know how you could say that these represent the same species. I mean, look at the look at the shape of the, of the jaw. Okay. This brow line right here. You can tell that this right here is the muscle attachment point. Look at the difference between the size of the muscle here and the size of the muscle on us. Those guys were cracking nuts with their teeth. Okay? We would just sit there and gnaw on it and do nothing. All right? I mean, heck, I have a problem with a piece of beef jerky. You know? So I don't know how you can say that those are the same species. What I found kind of funny is when I looked at this, I, I, you can't see it in this picture, but you can actually see the names of all the bones written on here. Apparently what they did is they took a cast of a, of a uh, anatomical uh, model with all the names of the bones written on there for, you know, for whatever, for anatomy class. I thought it was kind of amusing. Um, <clears throat> dinosaurs. There are evidence for dinosaurs living with man. Legends of heroes may be embellished accounts of actual events, very possibly the behavior just out of it. This one right here, the thing that they're saying might be a plesiosaur. Every marine biologist that's taking a look at the picture says, no, it's a type of shark. When it rots away, the, 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 mouth, the, the jaw drops away, and so basically you just have the skull and the, the, the neck, and it looks like the long neck of the plesiosaur. We done it? I'm sorry, I guess I ran out of time. Do I have any questions, anybody? I just wanted to, oh, let me just throw one last thing here. You guys know what Godwin's Law is on the internet? I do. Godwin's Law states that if any internet, uh, if any uh, argument goes on long enough on the internet, sometime, at some point, Hitler's gonna get involved. <laughs> this is like the last thing you see as you leave. <laughs> so apparently Godwin's Law actually applies to a so. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, then I'll be around for the next half hour or so. Anything at all? Thank you very much.